Hi, you're listening to Thoughtful Wellness Revolution, where we believe wellness isn't wellness if it's just for you. We're your hosts, Zara and Hien. And before we get started, please make sure to give us a five-star rating and review. Even though we're a podcast that believes in decolonizing, we're still bound to the algorithm. So every little bit that you can help us out, we really appreciate it. And we thank you for all the support. Let's get into it. Today, we are talking to Lena Wood, a certified nurse midwife in Tacoma, Washington. So Lena, what's on your mind today? Well, first of all, I am just so excited to be on this podcast with both of you. Um, when I met Hien uh, last fall, I think, at one of the Tacoma Boss Ladies um, networking events, I was like, ooh, that is someone I want to get to know. And then she told me about the podcast and what you guys were up to. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. We need more of that. So anyway, um, One thing on my mind is just that I'm excited to be here with some other amazing BIPOC wellness folks and just getting to be in conversation. Um, So I feel like there's not enough spaces for that. Um, But for me personally, what's on my mind, um, it's like the perennial question of like work-life balance and like what a shit show it is during the pandemic. Um, I am parent to a six-year-old who was out of school last week because there was a COVID case at his school. And so like, yep, I've been initiated (laughs) into that club. Um, Yeah, there's just a lot, you know, there's been a lot of change in my life in the past couple of years, which we'll probably talk about um, as the podcast unfolds. And I feel like there just hasn't been time really to, uh, to catch my breath. Um, but trying to find moments here and there. Um, so yeah, a little scattered today. Um, but excited to be here. I've got a couple more clients this afternoon, so I'm excited to kind of be in work mode for the afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, when I met you at that event months ago, I was just so excited because I was like, you are exactly the kind of person that I want to talk to on my podcast. And you're the kind of person whose work I really want to, um, you know, uplift and share with other folks. Um, and so, and also I want to say like, I've been feeling unscattered probably for like the last six months or I don't know how long it's, it's just a very, uh, uncertain time to be in. And, and it's like when you feel like you have a little bit cert- of uh, just like a tiny bit of certainty, there's like more uncertainty thrown at you. So oh, it's yeah. been wild. Yeah. So I just want to say like, you know, hang on in there. And to anyone else listening who's dealing with it, it's like we see you and we're I mean, we're all going through it. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I mean, these are the conversations I'm having with my clients every day. Like, how can they find even brief little moments of rest for them? You know, the 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 phrase self-care is overrated, I feel like, um, and cliche, but, you know, there really is this like collective moment of reckoning. I feel like where we're all trying to figure this question out. And I'm like, dude, I don't have any brilliant answers. (laughs) (laughs) Like I am in the same struggle as you are. I have no idea. I'm going to encourage you to exercise and move and be in your body. And and then I'm going to acknowledge that my Peloton has sat unused for like the past (laughs) four weeks in my house, four weeks is being generous. You know, um, it's like, it's just real right now. Yeah. Yeah. I really, yes. Yeah. I feel like I love the way that you said, like, I don't have any answers. We don't have, nobody has any answers right now because we are in such unprecedented times. And it is like you said about finding the moments of rest and joy. Um, and I recognize you were saying you're talking about your clients with that. And I'm a little curious, could you tell us um, a bit about your journey into becoming a midwife and what exactly a midwife is in your terms? Yeah, absolutely. So um, historically, I think most people think of midwives as um, women um, and cis women historically um, who attend to other women during childbirth, you know, pregnancy, childbirth in the in the postpartum time. Um, I feel like that definition of midwifery 
is really narrow and I don't think it actually historically was limited to that either. Um, for me, midwifery is very much an intersectional practice of you know, both the physical, emotional components of caring for people uh, with uteruses who may or may not be having babies, um, but also you know, recognizing and witnessing and supporting and being there throughout the reproductive years. So from the first time someone gets their menses all the way through menopause, regardless of what choices um, they're making around their reproductive health, a midwife can be there to support them. And truly historically, midwives were the village healers. They were there at births, they were there at deaths, they did everything else in between. The midwife was the one that everyone was like, yeah, that person is the one you wanna call when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> um, so my journey to midwifery, I actually had no intentions of becoming a healthcare provider of any kind uh, growing up. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to be a figure skater. I was going to be a flutist. Um, you know, I'm of the Christy Yamaguchi generation. So I grew up watching her and, and yes, and seeing another Asian American um, on the ice like that was just amazing. Um one really important thing about me is that um, I am a Korean American adoptee and I grew up in a very white working class family in Minneapolis who, um, you know, basically were told like, treat this baby as if, you know, she were yours, as if she were a blank slate. Um, so I grew up in a very white culture. Um, and I also grew up not knowing really anything about my birth story, my birth family, um, and that part of my narrative. So there was always this little like missing piece in my life and my story. And I was always fascinated by it, but also felt this like kind of taboo, like because I didn't know anything about my birth story, it felt weird to be interested in birth. Um, so anyway, that comes up later in my journey. Um, I grew up, I went to college, I graduated from Mount Holyoke, which is an amazing women's college in Western Mass. Um, my major was geography, basically because I couldn't really decide what I wanted to major in. So geography was great because I got to study a little bit of everything. Um, but what I've come to realize is that the skills and frameworks of geography, which is really thinking about space and place and connections between people and land, and um, how we make meaning in home and different places. Um, it really kind of informs how I, how I engage in my work as a midwife, which yes, is about caring for physical bodies and emotions, but also a lot of it's just holding stories, um, stories that nobody else will ever hear. Um, so fast forward, I thought I was going to be an environmental educator, like open a farm school. Then I went into Montessori education. Then I had a like crisis, a quarter life crisis where I was like, oh my gosh, I just like got my master's degree in Montessori education and I love it. And I don't want to be a classroom teacher. Well, crap, what should I do now? Um, and a friend of mine suggested, um, that I, actually embrace this like ongoing interest I've had in birth and dive in and do a doula training. Um, and I was like, I'm 25. Like who's going to want someone who's never been to a birth and doesn't even know anything about birth or her own birth to be at their birth and support them. Um, so I, I started as a postpartum doula because that felt a little safer for me. Um, I'd worked with kids a lot. I had my Montessori background. So um I did that. And then I just kind of like fell in the rabbit hole of the birth world, um, kind of like people do. Um, and for a long time, I told myself and my husband, like, no, 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 I don't want to be a midwife. That's too much responsibility. It's too much work. It's too scary. Like, what if something goes wrong? But the more I was around birth, the more I was around midwives, and the more I was around pregnant people, um, I just got hooked and I realized like this is the perfect intersection of my passions and interests in terms of reproductive justice and 
you know, advocacy and politics and a personal desire to be of service in a really meaningful, intimate kind of way. Um, and so one thing led to another, and um, over a period of a couple of years, I got really involved in the full spectrum doula movement, so supporting folks through abortion, miscarriage, adoption, pregnancy loss, all of the other pregnancy experiences that um, I feel like now the narrative has shifted a fair amount, but you know, 10 years ago when I was um, getting involved in that community it was still very radical. Um, and my experiences as a pregnancy options counselor at a pro-choice options counseling field nine and um, as a support advocate at Planned Parenthood, those are really the experiences that pushed me over the edge to say, you know what, I actually want to be a clinician. I want to have the skills and the knowledge and the sort of the credentials to like move into this world and this system and help change it because Lord knows this is not a BIPOC LGBTQ trauma informed space. You know, this is, um, yeah, it just, it wasn't at the time. And I think, again, that is changing. That's like a whole nother podcast about the politics of anti-racism in the midwifery world. Um, but you know, still like I look around and I don't see other midwives who look like me. There are a fair number now of African-American and black midwives, and that's part of a long historical trajectory, but still 90% of at least certified nurse midwives in the U S are white. Um, black midwives make up another like 8% and the remaining 2% are a mix of Asian, Native American, et cetera. Um, Latinx. So um, yeah, that's the the short version of how I got into midwifery. Um, I was really passionate about the full spectrum of midwifery care. So not just pregnancy and birth, but also in particular abortion care. And I was really lucky where I trained in Oregon. I went to Oregon Health and Science University for both my undergraduate in nursing and then my master's in midwifery. Um, and in Oregon, midwives have had independent scope of practice for a long time. They're really well respected and known. Um, almost 20% of babies in Oregon are born into the hands of nurse midwives. Um, and in Oregon, advanced practice nurses, um, FNPs, family nurse practitioners and nurse, certified nurse midwives um, are able to provide abortion care, which is not true, obviously, in every state. There's a lot of states with you know, very restrictive physician only laws. And even then it's like, you have to jump through all these hoops, et cetera. But in Oregon, um, I saw nurse midwives providing really lovely, compassionate abortion care that felt different coming from a midwife than it did coming from an OBGYN or even a family nurse practitioner because of, I think that historical model of midwifery of really being with people regardless of their life experience, having that non-judgmental really lifespan perspective that the same people who are having abortions are also parents and are gonna be parents in the future. Um, being able to see that as part of an arc of a person's life rather than just a discrete medical event um, really changed the experience. So I went into midwifery in love with birth, but also very passionate about expanding abortion care for midwives um, as a way to expand access in general. So my current practice, I um, am not currently trained to provide second trimester procedures, but I do medication abortion up through 10 weeks. Um, and that's a really important component of my practice. Um, and actually I'm not doing birth right now. Um, that was a recent decision. Um, I don't know. Um, I think last time we talked to I was still doing home birth. Um, but I, after, so I started my independent private practice a year ago after leaving a job that was not a great fit. Um, I had up until that point for the past five years worked in hospital-based practices, which is where most nurse midwives work. 
Um, and I just, I was done. I was tired of the system. I was tired of being a cog in the wheel. I was tired of not actually being able to practice the way that I wanted to, which is, um, you know, not being stuck in 15 minute appointments with people, you know, 25 people a day, like that's not midwifery care. Um, for me, I mean, I know a lot of midwives who somehow make it work and that's amazing, but it just wasn't sustainable for me. So I started a practice last year here in Tacoma, recognizing that there weren't a lot of BIPOC midwives and um, certainly not a lot of midwives who kind of had this full spectrum perspective that I come with. Um, and I had a great year and I loved a lot of aspects of it. And also learned that being on call 24 seven as a home birth midwife is really brutal. And um, I just wasn't in a place in my life and where I am with my family to be able to do that. So I'm actually um, kind of at a turning point in my practice, which is really exciting. And um, I have stepped back from attending births and doing prenatal care. Um, but I'm doing a lot more fertility care now. So intrauterine insemination um, at home and in the office, particularly for the queer community. Um, what else am I doing? Just, you know, general GYN stuff, annual exams. I love doing annual exams. I love doing people's first pap smears and like making it a really empowering, positive experience that sort of sets that expectation for people of this does not have to be scary, shaming painful, like you're in charge of this exam. Um, and like the best thing that someone can say to me is like, oh, wow, that was like the best pap I've ever gotten. <laughs> um, and then I am um, expanding some of my lactation support um, and pursuing training to become a board certified lactation consultant. Um, and because I'm addicted to school and I just kind of can't really stop, um, I'm also um, starting classwork to um, get my certification as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Um, and really, that's my my passion and where I see myself going in my practice. I love um, I love the reproductive health piece, and I love you know doing general GYN care. But so much of what I do as a midwife revolves around supporting mental health and wellness and emotional well-being and supporting people and making behavioral health changes like quitting smoking and things like that and I want more training and resources to do that um, so I'm doing an online distance program right now through Frontier Nursing University and it will allow me to work um, while I'm in school and then I you know, a couple of years down the road, envision my practice really being focused on um, the field of what we call reproductive psychiatry or perinatal and mental health. It's not just perinatal for me. Like, yes, there's a lot around pregnancy and postpartum, but also perimenopause and, you know, post-abortion and life in general. Um, having that perspective as a midwife, I feel like will really inform the mental health care that I provide. So yeah, that's kind of the roundabout answer to um, my journey to becoming a midwife, what it means to me, even um, as I transition more to mental health work, um, the identity and practice and, and way of being as a midwife is still really important to me. I will always be a midwife, um, no matter what I'm doing professionally. So yeah. Wow. I just want to say, I think that you are like a freaking rock star. Like <laughs> everything that you shared was just blowing my mind. And I really appreciate you sharing about, you know, how, I guess the full spectrum part of midwifery, because yeah. I just always think of it as like, okay, it's like pregnant people and babies. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, th mm -hmm. that's kind of where I see it. And it's interesting that you share the statistics about like, I guess how white the field is because I feel like, yeah, thinking about it, I don't think any people in my family had worked with a midwife. Mm -mm. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that has ever occurred to me as even an option. Like when I think about for me and my own like healthcare. Well, and so much of the midwife. narrative around midwifery is tied up in the history of obstetrics as a field and like, 
this could be a whole nother podcast, but essentially obstetrics and gynecology and the way it developed as a discipline in the United States depended on the practice of white OBs working on black slave bodies without their consent. And as the white medical industrial complex kind of grew and expanded in its power, they created a narrative that midwives were, you know, less skilled, dirty, like unhygienic, et cetera. So then when you have this whole like wave after wave of immigrants coming in, the story they were told was midwives are backwards. Like doesn't matter if you had great midwives in your culture where you came from. If you want to live the American dream, you go to the hospital and have your baby. You go to see the white doctors. That's how you get excellent care. And so now there is this like this funny dynamic where You know, you and I come from cultures that may have historically used midwives more, but, you know, generations who grew up here, second and third generation families are more likely to say, oh no, like we don't, why would we want to use a midwife? That's what we used way back when, when we didn't have anything better, but now I can go to the doctor and it's kind of unlearning um, a lot of a false narrative around how that came to be and relearning the power of midwifery. Um, but yeah, you know, I've met a few other surprisingly um, Korean adoptee midwives who I feel like we have a particular experience because we didn't grow up in Asian American cultures um, or Asian cultures in our families. And um, yeah, like I can count the number of Asian midwives I know on on two hands like it's really it's really small I feel like it's growing but it's small and like there's this whole treasure trove of experience and story that I know is out there um there actually is someone I'm gonna have to find her name for you and give it to you later um they have an Instagram um right now and it's about Asian American birth culture and it's so cool I'm learning a ton um Cause there's all these cool birth practices that like, I never knew about. Um, so anyway, side tangent. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No, I love that. Like I would be so interested in that because I will be honest and say that I have actually tried to Google that before, Mm -hmm. like specifically like birthing practices for Vietnamese women or whatever. Yes. And I didn't really find much. I just found like, I don't know, some like scientific like study journal about you know right. well, so, some experience for Vietnamese Americans or something and I was like no this is not what I was looking for but cool things right, right, right um right. so that is very exciting to hear that I don't know there's it just sounds like there's so much uh possibility and evolution in midwifery and like I I would not have thought of that but at the same time I know that it is true for like the yoga spaces where mm-hmm. things are really popping off and happening and and so I think many different fields and what within the wellness umbrella there are things happening which is why we're here to talk about and share about it so people know because how else would they know exactly exactly Uh, yes I love also that you're sharing um about specifically like Asian midwifery and birthing um stories and community because I had a very different experience I guess when it came to midwifery than Hien growing up because my mom as I told you before my mom was a doula Um, And her good friend was a black midwife um, who she worked with. So I grew up with that being like a thing that was available and good for like underserved or black communities or marginalized communities where you Mm -hmm. got accessible birthing care, which is like so much of what you're talking about. But even still, I will say I shared some of the I'm still undoing some of the ideas of birthing and Mm -hmm. like, I want to say like sterilization of birth because I feel like with you, the way you're talking about birth is it's like a holistic process and like the whole life of a person with a uterus, you know what I mean? And like that whole process and like the various stages of it versus like um, very individualized and specific sterilized pieces of, Mm. or like you said, medical procedures of someone's life. So I think I found that really interesting to hear the statistics because they are so wildly different from my own experience. And my first um, pap smear was also by a gynecologist. And I do recommend it because it was like, I remember all of my friends were so weirded out and scared Mm -hmm. of them. 
in college. And I was like, oh, like that was not a weird thing for me at all. Like, I don't understand what, but, and that's the difference is that mine was done by a midwife because there is such a level of care and concern and compassion. And I just hold so much res respect for what you're doing. And I appreciate you sharing with us and teaching us um, about the spectrum of it, because I under I knew about death doulas as well. Mm -hmm. um, it was something I kind of started looking into when I lost my dad a few years ago. Cause I was like, wow, this is such a powerful field. And like to be able to share and express and like go through that and like to have that support would be so amazing for so many people. Um, but yeah, like even post-abortion care, perimenopause, like, wow. Oh, oh my gosh. I was going to ask you a question, but I forgot. Cause I'm just so amazed. Right. So <laughs> I think that there's um like, there's this unspoken kind of understanding in the midwifery world that when, as midwives get older and they start to like burn out, you know, the candle on both ends from doing births, you know, day in, day out, many of them, because this is a lifelong field, many of them find other sort of subspecialties to focus on. For some people, it's hospice work and like transitioning to like palliative care and that kind of thing. For other people, it's perimenopause and really focusing in on supporting um, folks during that transition because it's such a, you know, it has such a shallow stereotyped narrative around what that is like. And it's so much more complicated than that. Um, I mean, I, for me, midwifery at the heart of it, like it's about sexual and reproductive health and that encompasses a lot of different aspects of life. But, you know, in my annuals, I ask people, how's your sex life? Like what's working, what's not working. And I tell you the number of people of all ages who have said, oh my God, you are the first person who's ever actually just asked me purely out of being interested and in, like wanting me to have a pleasurable sex life. Um, you're the first person that's ever thought to ask me that. I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's such a huge component of our lives and so important to our well being, regardless of like specific practices or not, just our relationship with our sexuality and our bodies. And it boggles my mind that people can go their entire lifetime and never be asked. Um, so that's a really important component of my um, being in midwife is normalizing all of these conversations. Like, yes, let's talk about sex. Let's talk about how we aren't having it. Let's talk about how it's always the same, you know, whatever. Um, there's, there's a lot more to midwifery than just, just the babies. I always joke, you know, people will ask me sometimes like, oh, you must really love babies if you got into midwifery. And I was like, no, I love really working with women, you know, people with uteruses, women defined, however that is. Um, if I really loved babies, which I do, but if I love them that much, I would have been a pediatrician or a pediatric nurse practitioner or somewhere like those are the folks who work with the babies, but I like working with the people who bring them into the world. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just want to say I love that because so often we overlook the vital and roles that mothers and parents and, you know, people who raise humans play and we need people who care about them and concerned about them. So yes, um, the birthing process is not just about the baby. Thank you. <laughs> I just so appreciate everything you're saying and sharing with us and you know, I, I just feel like I want you to know that what you're doing, you probably know it. I'm sure people tell you, but I just think what you're doing is so important because even as you're talking about these topics and bringing it up, you're shattering, I feel like so many taboos. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's also something about being like an Asian American woman where these type of taboos and expectations are on you right. about whether, you know, thinking about sexuality and talking about that. It's, it's like, that was not something I was encouraged to do, you know, but, nope. <laughs> you know, and, and even thinking about, um, again, thinking about getting care from a midwife, again, that was never something I was exposed to. And again, up until basically, I didn't even know until I met you months ago, when you, mm -hmm. when you mentioned that you did full spectrum care and what that meant, because mm -hmm. up until then, I was just thinking, oh, yeah, midwife equals mom and baby, that's it. And like, the only midwife I knew was, um, this one white woman who was also a yoga teacher. So like, there's all these already 
yeah ideas of what that means right and then as you explain everything I was like okay that makes sense and I feel like you're connecting the dots with for me in so many ways of like just again seeing the possibilities of what midwifery really means or what it could look like and I'm just really grateful for it and so with all that you have done and are doing and are looking to do um and we ask this question with everyone you know what's one thing you want to see more of and what's one thing you want to see less of and in wellness um it seems like you have a very uh broad grasp of what wellness looks like in life as a midwife but also if you want to answer this based on midwifery as it is right now sure yeah so I would say for midwifery in particular, there's just so much still like binary thinking about um, the realm of birth and pregnancy and becoming a parent and, you know, the mommy wars, like they're still going on (laughs) Um, and it is really toxic sometimes. Um, I feel like a lot of my work as a midwife is helping normalize for people, like whatever their pregnancy, birth, parenting experiences were like, it's okay. It's okay that you got an epidural. Like it's not only okay. It's like freaking awesome that you decided that that was the thing you needed to help get you to meeting your baby and being present, you know, like these kind of binaries of natural versus medicated, um, attachment parenting versus whatever, like, I'm just over it. And even within midwifery, you know, there's this kind of like holding up on a pedestal of the midwife who like self-sacrifices everything and is there for their clients and stays late for births and is like, is always there every moment of the day. And I'm so over that too, you know, like midwives and many other wellness, um, providers, um, practitioners, like putting themselves up on pedestals and making it about them. Like it, that also has its consequences, um, for one, for midwives, like we have some of the highest divorce rates among any clinicians. And like, you think about it, like we're basically married to our jobs, right? Like there's another presence in the relationship. We miss kids' birthdays and holidays and, you know, constantly having to negotiate like who or what is more important. Um, And that's hard. It's really hard on families. Um, So I, part of my journey this past year has been like, creating a little more space in how I identify as a midwife and that while I will always identify as a midwife, like maybe it doesn't always have to be the primary thing. Like there, there are other things that I like doing in life and other things I like talking about. Like, I don't need to talk about vaginas all day long. Like I could, I have lots of things to say about them. (laughs) And there are other things that I like doing and, I, and that makes me a better midwife. Um, Cause I see a lot of people just get completely consumed in the identity and the, the branding almost of, of midwifery and the birth world. So yeah, a little less uh, rigidity around um, the stories we tell about that profession and birth and what it all means. And what I would love to see more of is more BIPOC and queer folks in this profession. We need to diversify uh, it like, and this isn't just a like, trying to like make the scales equal. Like we have evidence, lots and lots and lots of research that shows that when people get care, what we call concordant, racially concordant care, when they get care from providers who look like them, who come from the same neighborhoods, who have the same backgrounds, they have better outcomes. And it just like makes so much sense on an intuitive level, but we have so much work to do to catch up. you know, it's going to take us a long time to get from 90% white to, you know, closer to 50, 50, or, you know, more reflective of what the actual population is. Um, So right now, the way I support that is just like encouraging and supporting and mentoring as many aspiring BIPOC midwives as I can, like, 
it's a hard experience getting through school, particularly if you're going the nurse midwifery route and going through all of the the racially traumatic experience of nursing school and working in the medical industrial complex, like it is, it's hard. Um, but I really see that as like a key cornerstone to improving um, perinatal health in this country. Like we didn't even talk about the terrible outcomes and disparities and outcomes uh, between black parents and, and other folks, but um, that's a huge piece of it. So Yes, that's what I would like to see more of um, in midwifery. But I think that extends to the wellness field in general. And I know some of your other episodes have talked about that too. Like enough already with the whitewashed version of yoga and wellness and <laughs> spandex, like enough. We, ha- we, ha- we have enough vinyasa. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you for saying that. Uh, I mean, thank you for saying everything, but yeah, um, <laughs> in case anyone else needs to be convinced, we've had, we, we do have had enough of uh, vinyasa. Yes. Um, yeah. Th- thank you so much, Lena. Um, can you tell us how people can get in touch with you and learn more about your work? Yeah. So my website, which is a work in progress, is www.revolutionsmidwifery.com. I'm actually in the middle right now of um, a website refresh with a fellow Asian American woman from Vancouver, Washington, which I'm really excited about. So I'll probably have a a shiny, fresh new website later this spring. Um, But it's got all the basics on there right now. And then I... In theory, I'm on Facebook. I don't really post there very much, but I'm more on Instagram um, at Revolutions Midwifery, and that's where I tend to post the most. So those are my two places. Thank you so much, Lena. We've really enjoyed talking to you. And, you know, I just can't wait to see what else you do. Like, literally, I'm just like everything you're sharing about yourself and what else, uh, sort of the way your path is evolving. Like, I, I just can't wait to see it and support it. So I'm sure there'll be something I get bored easily. So <laughs> I'm, I'm always taking on new things. <laughs> I love it though, because like you were talking about with your practice, you know, or with like um, the stages of life and the stages of birth and the stages of like moving through things like that's what you're doing with your work and that's midwifery. So it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our post interview. Uh, after our conversation with Lena. And that was amazing, wasn't it, (laughs) Zara? It was epic. Um, I love dualship and midwifery because I think having that space is so important. And to hear someone doing it in, because midwifery, I think in and of itself, when midwifery can be radical and to hear a, um, holistic radical approach in a way that um, really supports community and people with uteruses was really fantastic. What about you? How do you, how did you feel about it? I just feel like I'm in love with Nina and I just need to tell the world about it. And I, I'll tell her that as well soon as, as happens when we do our interviews is that we just fall in love with the folks that we talk to because, you know, I, I just feel hopeful, I guess, which is not something I feel a lot lately. Um, I feel hopeful because she was so informative. Like I learned so much and she connected the dots for me um, thinking about like big picture, like life and midwifery and like how that includes in like a person's life uh, or how that could maybe should include in a person's life um, for their own wellness. And I just felt really like lucky to live in a world where somebody like Lena exists and is doing the work that she's doing, you know? Oh my God. Yes. Because it's like truly such a, it's a really hard time to be alive. Everyone. I think we can all just, you know, mutually agree upon that. It is when we were recording this, it is Jan early January, 2022. <sighs> even saying that makes me feel stressed out. Um, But like, we are actually also in a really beautiful time where like people like Lena exist. 
um, and this podcast exists where we get to share and hear about people who are doing things that are that are breaking down structures um, through information, education, and compassion. Um, and that's really what we need more of. So to hear and have someone on the podcast who was talking about that, I think was really important. And I just am remembering something that I, I remember I, during the interview, I was like, oh, I forgot what I wanted to say. And I wish Lena were here so we could say it to her. But um, I think Shirdi knows this, but the being able to ask questions in your um, doctor's office during your exams, especially during um, gynecological exams or any sort of like intimate exam, right? That uh, we experience being able to ask questions and de it, you're being able to deconstruct the process a bit, you know, where it's like, oh, you have to get in, you have to have this, you have, it's all standard, right? But when you get to ask questions and when you get to ask for what you want and feel comfortable doing that, you kind of break down the system where it's like, it breaks down the sterilization a bit, you know, and having people who are educating us to do that in Western spaces, because we do believe Western medicine does have, you know, great, it does great things. And, <laughs> Uh, the medical industrial complex is also really shit. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think you had brought up like the sterilization, right. Of like, like, I remember, uh, how, when she was talking about what being like a full spectrum midwife meant and how it's literally from like birth to the end, you know, um, and how you were saying how it's so good to hear about that because normally you see it as like it's like a sterilized compartmentalized of like, oh, like someone's a provider, like just for birth or like just for menopause or like just for pelvic, like just for something like that. And I really appreciate that holistic um, perspective. And I, I remember her saying something along the lines of how she sees midwifery as being intersectional. And I think that makes such a big um, difference to maybe the typical. And then of course, when she threw us with the stats, I was like, whoa, like the stats of how, how white uh, midwifery is right now. Um, I just feel like her work is just so important and pushing, pushing for that to be a different number than 90% white. <laughs> yeah, no. And it was so crazy to me because I've just my own personal experience with midwives and the midwives that I know. Um, but like I, and sorry, the intersectionality of it is kind of like built into it. And it's so beautiful and what, or like the potential for it is built into it because it is offering care and community um, to people who are birthing children. You know what I mean? Like that, the ability to like, and to offer care in like marginalized communities is really wonderful. And I was going somewhere with this, um, <laughs> but I, Oh, right. Like the whiteness of it. And it makes me realize because what I was saying is that like doulas and midwives, they provide care and compassion and connection and community for um, people who are bearing children or post birth or um, perimenopause or all sorts of things. And as Lena was telling us, like post abortion care and pre abort, you know what I mean? Like all sorts of things, right? You have this level of compassion and connection that I think mm, I don't know how to say this in a non-controversial way but I feel like in white spaces which I it makes sense that the dynamic has grown to be a lot of white midwives because it's like a thing where white feminism is like oh women are being supported and that generally means white women are being supported and so it's like offering care and community and support in those places and forgetting the fact that midwifery exists to offer all people having babies and women, um, people with uteruses, um, like a chance to, I don't know. Uh, sorry. I'm really rambling on here, no, but like, it's all good. yeah, right. I'm taking, I'm not apologizing for taking up space, but, um, like offering a chance to give that care and compassion community. And it forget, we forget that it's so often forgotten in society that like, Black, Indigenous, and um, marginalized folks don't get that. And it's like, oh, it should be a luxury, right? And like, no, it's like a necessity. That's <laughs> actually literally, that thought crossed my mind as well. But I like kind of forgot 
got, um, but as she was talking, there was something that in my mind that I was thinking like, you know, of um, this thought pop in my mind of like, is having a midwife a luxury? Is that a privilege or should it be a right? You know, like, I, you know, I just kind of had those like philosophical thoughts at the very back of my mind. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's something worth considering because um, I, I, of course, feel like we should all get the best of the best. I mean, I really want the best for everybody. Like I literally do want the best for everyone, but of course, I mean, it's even, I mean, think about it just like with like yoga, right? Like do black indigenous folks of color deserve good yoga teachers? Do they deserve uh, accessible yoga and trauma-informed teachers? Well, of course you and me would say, yeah, hell yeah, we do, right? Like, hell yeah, we do, hell yeah, they do. Um, and because of the systems we live in, it's hard for that to be a reality. And I think, oh, we're in the US and I think everyone listening knows this, but we have a fucked up medical, like healthcare system. Like the medical industrial complex is um, not easy to navigate. And, and so there's um, that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and that's why I think we need more black, brown, um, marginalized minor people of the global majority um uh midwives because like i grew up like okay so my mom is english um the midwife that she worked with um was also english and she is a black woman and so she when she came to america she was working within black communities right and was working with underserved communities. And that was like a lot of the work that my mom, so it was like, you're, it's not, I understood midwifery as like, I was obviously a kid, but like in the, I, in the same frame of like nonprofit work or charity, you know what I mean? Like where you're giving back, like, and that's what it is. And so it was so weird for me to, as an adult, come across midwifery on like Instagram and stuff as hire me and I'll be your midwife. And like, it's, so much money and I'm fancy or whatever, whatever. And like, I don't think they're all like that, obviously, because we just talked to Lena, Lena and it was like, so uh, wonderful and like, just uh, beautiful. And I know there are some, there are people who are doing that work and it's so hard. It's hard to feel like it's not a luxury and it is a necessity for community because like, especially in this country where people are under, served medically um because we all oh so many people lack health care or unless you're part of the one you percent like basically unless you're part of the one percent <laughs> you are underserved when it comes to your health care basically like i feel um, pretty confident yeah. saying that i mean like i pay i pay too much money for health care because i like have chronic illnesses and i need to go to doc you know what i mean like i and i like, anyways, I don't want to get into that because that's a whole disability is a whole other thing, which like I am not well versed enough to speak about, um, like applying for disability aid and like what that means financially and blah, 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 um, because I don't know enough. But yeah, um, it is it's so interesting to see how a practice which like has historically been about serving women and serving communities has become within white wellness a weird luxury and a flex of i i don't like this because i don't think it's true but like a flex of like your belief in pseudoscience Ooh, <laughs> in yeah so many i know I, I know what you mean it's that you know and i think lena mentions it with that sort of like the binary between like the natural versus medicaid folks right like I definitely kind of I don't know it too well but I can definitely sense how like there are people like that in midwifery and like the type of woman who may choose to have a midwife or you know who could afford one right and yeah it's not all but I I know what you mean because it's the same way in yoga right like not every yoga teacher or yoga practitioner is into pseudoscience but then also a lot of them um get kind of caught up in that it's yeah, because there are so many little like whole rabbit holes you can fall down. You know what I mean? Because it's not just like, oh, I believe 
I do yoga. So I believe in lizard people. You know what I mean? Like there are so many rabbit holes along the way that you can fall down with like food or diet or exercise or um, chakras or like so many different things that can lead you to like anti-Semitism, white supremacy and a just pure hatred and bigotry um, <laughs> that is masked in wellness and taking care of yourself and it, it's just so difficult for people to understand nuance and it's that's why it's so important for us to have these conversations and have people like Lena on where we can have these conversations about nuance you know what I mean um because it, it's not a binary like you were saying it's so it's so much more than that yeah I I definitely agree and I think it's great to show folks that midwifery could look like what Lena is doing um because yeah basically with what everything that you just said um I I think about it a lot and how the wellness well I don't like to think about it but I am I guess confronted with the fact that there are you know in wellness there's just so many um I guess like you said rabbit holes that you can fall into and you know, it's, it's tough to see. And so that is why it's important for us to, you use the word nuance. And so I think like to be along with that is to like be discerning of the types of, I guess, wellness providers there are, right? (laughs) Like to be discerning of like, yeah, there's a lot of yoga teachers out there. Um, And like me and Zara, we're like a type of yoga teacher, um, you know, we're trauma informed, we're pretty radical, we care about decolonizing, and we care about anti racism. Um, we care about like all these other, I guess, intersection, like it's an intersectional lens. And then I feel like when it comes to healthcare, I think it's the same way with like, uh, midwives, as well as doulas, as well as I think I, even doctors, right? <laughs> like, there are doctors who, um, think differently than each other. I mean, I think um, that is the case with, um, if you listen to the bonus episode, in the bonus episode, um, I talk about my own personal experiences with like getting pap smears and like the difference between the first one I got and the the first doctor I had versus um, the second time that I got my pap smear and how that felt for me. Um, So yeah, all all that to say, um, there's just a lot out there and we hope to share with you some more nuance and to share with you discernment, I guess, in terms of looking at different wellness folks. Yeah. um, And I love that. And I want to ask you, I guess, do we want to do this before we wrap up? Um, Because I was going to ask you what's on your mind. What is on my mind? Oh my goodness. Yeah, let's do this before we wrap up. Okay, folks. So again, we are recording in January 2022. And um, it's not easy being alive right now. And everybody (laughs) we know is tired. uh, And we are tired. And the thing that's been on my mind is just how, how fucking wild things are and how there is so much happening that is painful and yet there is also this weird it's not everywhere but there's also this kind of weird quiet push to pretend that everything is normal I feel like you know the meme with like the dog in a burning room that's like everything is fine holding that little cup I feel like that I feel like everything is fine but it's not fine but we also have to sort of talk ourselves into it being fine to some extent so that we can keep going. I don't know. It's a lot. That's a lot. Basically a lot is on my mind. So I'll let you talk, Zara. Um, absolutely. I appreciate you letting me talk because I'm like bursting to say something about this because I'm also thinking about the same thing all the time. And that's what's on my mind because it is a difficult time here in the world. If you are a person who lives alone or has to spend a lot of time isolated if you're a chronic person with a chronic illness, if you're just anyone existing in the world right now, you understand. And I, we are here and we are hoping to provide you just a little bit of uh, connection and community and just know that you are loved. 
um, so, so deeply loved. Um, but it's a fucking hard place to be right now. And I am pretty much at the point where like everybody knows that things are about to break. Um, and it feels like corporations are trying to get like billionaires are trying to get as much money as they can to get as much reason. Like I would, for reasons I can't seem to quite understand. I don't because they're sociopaths. Like it is a proven thing. I was literally going to say, I was going to be like, because you're not a sociopath. That's why you don't get it. Cause you're not. Yeah. Just like, I don't have, yeah. So, um, so I'm, uh, and I, I don't even think that's the right term. So I want to be mindful of the language we're using there, but like, yeah. Um, where they don't care about people. I do care about people, maybe too much. Um, and it feels like the only thing that's giving me hope, well, one of the things that really gives me hope always, which we talked about when we first logged on is this podcast and working with each other. Cause um, it is a reminder because we get to talk to each other and have these great conversations and get to talk to people like Lena and have these great conversations. And uh, I think we're at the point where since like everyone is like either tr- like they're trying to push us through to get back to normal, which is like not a thing that is going to happen right now. I think COVID stuff will get better in the summer, but I think being pushed right now is going to break people in such a way that by the time spring and summer rolls around, and even if COVID numbers are low, I think people are not going to be going back to normal. I think it's time. (sighs) We need to start, um, figuring out systems of mutual aid and really putting our boots to the ground and trying to get involved in things and building networks because they basically cannot afford for us to take nine days. They cannot afford for the American workforce to take nine days off of work without the American economy collapsing. People recognize right now more than I think they have in the past that we have the power. Um, So... Yeah, I think getting systems in place and really starting to be like, okay, it's time to make some demands because if we cannot um, ensure the safety of the working class, which nobody in the government seems to be concerned about right now. um, So it's up to like us as people to create networks to do that, to move away from uh, the systems that are not serving us and create systems that do serve us so that the systems that are designed to serve us are forced to if they want to be relevant anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? Everything you say is just so real. And oh, it is, I cannot predict the future. And that's the thing. It's like none of us can really predict what exactly is going to happen next. And it it can be so frustrating simply because I feel like, like there have been stressful times in my life, but at this point, I just feel like there's like real scariness. Like there's real fear. It's like justifiable, valid fear to have about life in the world around us. Right. And I just like feel that, I don't know. It's like a mist in the air. It's like in the fucking air, you know, like this, this sense of like fear, valid fear and uncertainty and I can just feel that and again you know there's again there's also that sort of like quiet uh feeling of like people who are I don't know in denial or whatever who just wants to push us back to normal or you know people who just don't give a fuck about people but also there's like this real like it's so funny there's like this real like misty fear or whatever I sound like I'm describing some horror movie I know there's like some horror movie some years back about like a mist or something a that mist. freaked everybody. And like, I, you know, I'm not trying to say that life is a horror movie, but it sure feels like it, <laughs> like sometimes right now. I mean, I'm not tripping, right? Like I'm not, it's not only no. me, right? Like there's, yeah. Um, no, I want to say that podcasters, if you know anything about the Enneagram, you will hear very clearly between he and I in these last two statements that we've made, the two and the four contrast of the positive outlook and- <laughs> Um, the like rush to help other people and deny our own feelings and the four um, let's really really feel the feelings because we don't know what's coming next Um, and I think they're both beautiful responses and true responses and you maybe you had a similar or different response and that doesn't mean you're a two or four I am just pointing out because I know mine and hands numbers and I love the balance because yeah 
Um, that existential dread and fear and the fog that's sitting upon all of us right now that is so palpable <laughs> is real. And I, I appreciate you for being a person who can name it and describe it in such a beautiful way and like share with us the reality of that because it is true because a lot of days and a lot of times it feels really fucking dark. Yeah. Because we don't know. We don't know. And... Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, basically, that's all I have to say. I, I don't really, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, oops, sorry, I'm a four. And like, I don't have like a inspiring, hopeful message at the end, other than like, you know, we love you. If you are listening, that means you're alive. And we're so happy you're alive. Um, and that's all. That's all I have to say at this point, Zara. Any, any other final words you have? Yeah, also, I just want to say like, we don't need to end on optimism because that's what is reality. You know what I mean? All stages of life. We're not sterilizing our experience. Um, Just because I'm feeling hyper positive because I am a one-to-one type in a one-to-one conversation with someone I really enjoy talking about a thing I really like, I'm interested in um, and feel really hopeful. Doesn't mean that it negates the fear or makes it better or worse. So yeah, whatever you're feeling right now, whatever you're feeling all the time is okay. And we love you and we are grateful for you. And whatever is going on in the world, whenever this episode is released, um, (laughs) we just are sending love to our future selves and all of our listeners who are listening and you at all times. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Thoughtful Wellness Revolution podcast. For bonus content, you can go to thoughtfulwellnessrevolution.substack.com and subscribe for $5 a month. You can also follow us on Instagram at Thoughtful Wellness Revolution to share your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening. 